everyone, I'm Kendria. I need you to go like, follow, and subscribe. Soul Productions. What's up everyone? And this is Next Level Thinking. What's up, everyone? It's another episode of Next Level Thinking. As you always know, we help you bring inspiration and take it to the next level. It's your host, Chris Holmes. But today I have a special guest by the name of... Erica Denise Fulton. Awesome. So go ahead and tell the audience a little bit about yourself because I connect with you on LinkedIn, but I want you to go ahead and hit the groundwork. Okay, well, as I stated before, my name is Erica Denise Fulton. I am a native Houstonian. Uh, one of my passions is dancing. I uh, have four godchildren. I am a licensed, uh, a licensed a professional counselor intern. I'm also what they call a licensed chemical dependency counselor. Um, and as a LPC intern, I'm supervised by Robin Exum. And finally, I am what they call a certified clinical anxiety treatment professional. Uh, what I do is I'm a contract therapist. So I work with troubled teenagers using various therapies, modalities, fancy little words. Um, the other thing about me is that I am, I'm a widow. Uh, my husband died 13 years ago. And I'm grateful for the journey because now I think about it in a totally different way. It has actually enhanced who I am, not just as a person, but as a counselor. It has fueled my passion for grief counseling and for really being able to sit with people in their pain and not try to fix them or talk them out of their pain or talk them out of their feelings, but just meet them where they are. And it allows me to also be what I call a wounded healer, be vulnerable. I'm an author. I'm a co-author in the book, Empower um, Stories, from an empire of self-determined women. I'm so proud of that. Published author, so I'm excited. And that, oh, my, my uh, website is the comcorner.org where I do counseling-related blogs and things of that nature. So I'm excited about that. And I am actually working on two of, the, two of my own books. And I'm also in my doctoral program where my concentration is trauma, grief, and lost excited about what i'm learning and how it's stretching me and i mean stretching me <laughs> so that is a little bit about who i am both as a person and as a counselor Can't hear anything. My thing is totally muted. Why is my phone muted? Are you able to hear me? Yeah, I'm, I'm able to hear you now. Okay. It, for a minute, it just went silent on me, and I couldn't hear anything. It's all good technology. We're just gonna keep it going. But my question <laughs> is, like, how did you overcome the challenges of losing your husband going forward? Because I'm pretty sure there's other people who have faced some of the situation that need to hear either like a word of encouragement or how you kept going on in your journey? How, what kept me going, one of the things that kept me going, my faith, my faith in Christ, it was a huge factor. And my faith in Christ keeps me going today. But as I reflect back on that, that period, that journey in my life, as I stated before, I, I couldn't understand, I couldn't see it as a gift. It, it was almost like, God, you just played a really cruel joke on me. But my faith really helped me to get through that time because it, it also helped me to see God in a whole nother light. I had always said he is my father, but I, I can tell you that the comfort that God gave me during that time and the strength and the grace. And so one of the things that helped me was tapping into my spiritual resources tapping into my faith community, reaching out for support, not suppressing or holding in how I felt, whether it was good or bad. And I'm grateful that I had people around me who were sensitive to my journey. And so that's one of the things that helped me. Um, encouraging myself is one of the other major things. Exercise, nutrition, 
I started working on my weight, got my weight down, started working out. So exercise, it releases those happy endorphins though that we have in us naturally. So exercise, reaching out for support, utilizing my faith as a coping source. Those were three of the ways that it helped me to get through the the grieving process and really being honest with myself about where I was, about how I felt and not having to put on a mask. You know, a lot of times we put on masks. And I'm glad so, you brought, on, I brought that up because a lot of people do try to put on the cover of, you know, they're good, but being able to be completely open and transparent to what's going on in your life is actually how, it's like the, one of the biggest steps to actually overcoming yeah. and becoming better because we all have our different flaws. We need different people to connect to. And the fact mm-hmm. that you started working on yourself, changing uh, your diets, uh, working out and things like that is all part of working on yourself because it all does become begin with two and that is like the first major step of moving forward so I definitely agree with that yes I I just think it's so important and it's important to have that social support you know I always talk with my clients about which the adolescents and and then when I'm working with them I'm also dealing with addiction issues which you know a lot of it stems from trauma and loss and grief and for not just them, but for just us as human beings, a lot of times, you know, addictive behaviors are simply start off as mal as maladaptive ways of coping. You know? So for me being able to find those positive ways of coping and again just reaching out for that support, therapy. Therapy was a a, a major has been a major blessing for me because though I am a therapist, I have my own therapist. And sometimes I have to go do my checkup, you know, check in with me. Because life still happens to me. I'm not exempt because I'm a counselor. I don't, I wish I did get an exemption card. But it doesn't <laughs> work. Y'all do wish you have an exemption card. And I'm definitely glad you brought that up because a lot of times we see a lot of influential people, especially doing big things for the people we see on media. We see them as like they are completely perfect, no kind of flaws and things like that. But when a person becomes completely transparent, it makes that much relatable and much more. So kudos to you on that. My next thing I want to transition into is you have a lot of different certifications going on. And then on top of that, you're working in the community. So I know you went over it in the beginning, but I want you to go a little bit more in detail. Okay. Um, as I stated before, I'm, I'm what they call a contract here. So as a contract therapist, um, you know, what I do is just working with uh, troubled youth, children, adolescents. I deal with so many different issues. As I stated, trauma, grief, loss, eating disorders. I deal with, uh, uh, some of mine have uh, anxiety disorders, uh, anger management. Um, That's one of the main things that I deal with and of course you know you are dealing with teenagers who, <laughs> teenagers who are going you know they're going through adolescence too so you have to factor some of that in and you really have to have a lot of patience um I've actually been working with children for over 14 years um I initially started working with children as a daycare provider um and I was a daycare teacher for 10 years developing minds and so that was, a, that was a training ground for me, I would say, um, on how to interact with children, with adolescents. And in addition to that, in my church at Fresh Start Community Church, but well, my pastor is Troy Tyrone Johnson. I had to shout him out. Oh, my yeah, pastor, my father is in ministry. <laughs> so shout out to Troy Tyrone Johnson. You rock. You the best. He tells me the truth about myself. So, you know, that's another, I would say, um, strength in my life is I, I have a pastor who will speak the truth to me in love and he's still gonna speak the truth whether I want to hear it or not but <laughs> but in my my uh, my my home church we have what we call children's church which is more or less our youth ministry so I've been doing that for about four years and I'll never uh, forget one Sunday it wasn't even children's church it was like a third Sunday and one of the ministers said Y'all know y'all have 16 kids back there and they were all sitting at the table looking like, we ready to learn. 
and it was so but at the same time it was like wow these these kids are hungry to grow in their faith and you know i give god the glory for choosing me to be a vessel because he could have chosen a donkey could have chosen anybody but and i say that to say um at the same time I'm, i'm very humble um to be able to pour into their lives because they teach me so much you know, I, I learned from their childlike faith. So working with them has been a major blessing for me. That's part of what I do. Um, as I said, you know, being a clinician and, and being a, what they call an LPC intern, uh, it, it's a journey in and of itself, learning how to interact with others, learning about myself and the process as well. We are always evolving and growing or we're always supposed to be anyway. So that's, you know, another part of the journey. I'm also doing uh, what they call a training on ADHD because a lot of my clients have that. And so some of the things I have to do with them is I have to do sometimes what they call top-down strategies, uh, classroom behavior, addressing those types of issues, collaborating with some of the teachers, checking in with them, checking in on my clients and saying, hey, how is X, Y, and Z? You know, how is his behavior, her behavior been this week? understanding how to take that and integrate that into my therapy with them. And then I I do assign homework. I believe in homework to reinforce what we talked about in therapy and to to also help them to begin to engage in new behaviors. Um, I always talk about what they call neuroplasticity. And And the simplest way I know how to put it is that our brain literally has the capability to change itself to to change our way of thinking the brain can literally rewire itself with what we say so when we say words have power i mean there's some truth to that you know a lot of oh okay we have to agree to that because words do definitely have power because what you see basically i mean what you understand in your mind is basically becomes your own reality so if you think that you can overcome something in the reality it will come to fold now, what I want to dive a little bit more deeper in, especially with the kids, uh, what would you suggest to parents who have a hard time actually getting the kids' attention or to get on a, the right path? Because you have the experience of counseling in, in different environments, but what would you say to a parent that have a troubled child to get them back on track? Well, the, one of the things I would say, and, and I'm learning this, I'm really learning how to not just hear but listen. And I will say to them, okay, so what I'm hearing you say to me is, I'll just use an example. What I'm hearing you say to me is, I get really frustrated when people look at me funny because it reminds me of X, Y, and Z. And if they're like, yes, Miss Erica, or I can sometimes look at their face and they kind of give me that look like, how did she know that was really the underlying problem? Or they get really silent on me and I'm like, Oh, I see. I, I, I think I think I hit gold. I think I came upon gold. And you know, but one of the things that I've noticed that in really being able to connect with them is is meeting them where they are and not saying to them, What is wrong with you? Why did you do that? Have you lost your mind? You know, I really have to <laughs> because sometimes the godmother in me <laughs> wants to come out and I'm like, Erica unconditional positive regard unconditional you know, positive regard. Really a lot of traditional family special on my end i'm messing with you <laughs> <laughs> and so what that fancy word means is i enter into that world and i enter i enter into that world without my preconceived notions and judgments be like well why you know why have you been smoking weed since you were 10 i kind of well tell me about that you know, tell tell me more about the sadness. You say that you just, you know, you're feeling sad, you know, every day. Um, and and I try not to minimize what they've been through. And and I use just a simple example. You know, kids for, first start dating, and they're going through that. You know, they're testing those waters, and they have a breakup. And you know, it's like the whole world is over. And it's like, well, you know, it's really not that bad. You know, it's not the end of the world. But for them, it, it really, the, the, their reality is that it is the end of the world. For them, that is a major bonus. Like, wow, you know, that has to be really 
difficult for you and tell me about it. That you know, that is hard. And you I'm know, not, it sounds like that really shook your world. Like, tell me about that instead of being, you know, well, you know, another one will come along, and yes, more than likely it will. But being with them in that moment and staying with them in the moment, especially when it gets uncomfortable, and they go and they're screaming and they're hollering and they're, you know, sometimes I just sit there and listen. I won't even say anything. And I'm like, I'll wait 10 minutes. And then they, you know, they're done. I'm like, so did you get everything out you needed? And they look like, okay. And then, you know, I start probing and I start asking. But one of the things I would say is if you feel like you can't get through to a child that you may have who's troubled, it's okay to seek out, I would say, tell them okay you know what if you feel like you can't tell it to me or you may not feel like you want to open up to me hey open up to x y and z you know still encourage them to find a trusted adult who they can be honest with and they can let it out because sometimes you know kids they can hear another person say something and then they're like, man, this person's right. And go back to their parent and the parents thinking, I just said that to you like an hour ago, but because you know, it's mom and dad. They're like, Oh, what is it? And and oh, and they I, don't understand. I understand. And that goes back into what I was about to get into with the environment because environment is everything uh, from yeah. like what you see on a daily basis and what you see like from like a, a loving environment, something can be toxic and much more. And these kids, no matter what kind of situation they are, have a story. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what I feel is they just see, let's say a troubled kid and just look at all the faults, but they never mm -hmm. like you go into details, like look up oh, how this child actually turned into that. Like is there something going at home? And are they going through a uh, traumatic situation? You know, are what's constantly in their mm -hmm. ears, what they're constantly seeing, things like that. Yeah. Those are the things that's actually forming their perspective and what they see in the reality and life. Because if you yeah. don't have someone speaking positivity in their life, mm -hmm. they're going to see the negative. So that is definitely mm -hmm. spot on when it comes to that. Uh, so what I really want to go at next and today, I see you doing the things for the kids and, as well. But what do you do for the adults? Uh, when it comes to uh, counseling, because I'm pretty sure it's for everybody. And a lot of times I feel like people try to be so guarded and keep things inside. I feel like also, like you were saying earlier, I had to get myself checked too. You know, everybody has to talk to someone. So how do you uh, take your same experience from the past and much more to help adults in their life? Well, one of the things I do, and, and it is a similar approach, I do try to find ways to to build rapport you know and it doesn't mean i always try to find everything in common now most of my clinical work thus far i would say 80 percent 80 percent 85 percent has to do with adolescents and children but even within you know even within my day-to-day -day, as i'm traveling as i'm out and about as i'm just connecting with with different individuals i, I come across many different stories and so one of the things is, you know, as human beings, our, our automatic response is we gravitate to what's, what's familiar to us or people who are just like us. But one of the things that I like to try to do is, okay, well, maybe we got to find out what, what maybe is different about this person. Like maybe how can I, you know, learn some things from, from this from my interchange exchange with them and not just what well, oh looking at them as okay here's somebody i can fix well no this is another human being that's bringing some experiences to the table that don't look anything like me so i'm not a i'm i'm not above evolving or growing or even learning and i kind of go kind of bridge back just a little bit even with the the children and adolescents I, I counsel they they still you know teach me some things where I'm like wow okay I didn't realize that or why well, I never looked at it you know within that particular perspective but one of the things I do do with adults even with adults I will sometimes dip into childhood and say well okay tell me you know what happened when you were you know 
14 or why why do you believe this why do you believe that you know if i cry that somehow makes me weak or it somehow means i'm not a strong black man or a strong black woman and one of the things i even notice especially i, I hear you know i hear adults say to the african american males boys don't cry boys stop that crying i'll give you something to cry for and that disturbs my spirit because in my head i'm going okay these are these boys are going to turn into men who don't know how to express emotions and then they're going to turn into men who don't know how to express emotion outwardly and so they may seek other maladaptive ways to deal with how they feel because they've been that's been taught hey you know real men don't cry or you know i give you something to cry for and so I say that to say, you know, sometimes, not sometimes, then you see adult men and then, you know, people are like, well, why do they do that? Why do they react that way? Why do they behave that way? And I would contend that some of that is that there's a wounded eight or nine or 10 or 12 year old on the inside of them that never got healed and dictates much of their decisions, much of their thinking, and that they become so so conditioned to it that they don't really see that that inner child and that could be true of adults women and men but those are some of the approaches when adults may kind of pull me to the side hey i need to talk to you i'm dealing with this um i'm going through this i'm, I'm angry about this i'm stressed about this or you know this is how i re react when x y and z occurs so um, those are some of the uh, uh, approaches, and there's one other thing I forgot, because as I'm talking, I'm like, oh, well, I talk about the chaplain training, but in, in addition to me having my clinical training, I, I did a chaplain residency, and as a chaplain, one of the things they teach you how to do is to provide emotional and spiritual support and how to utilize a person's spiritual resources. So the chaplain training helps me when I deal with children, adolescents, or adults who may come to me in a hysteria. And they're just, you know, screaming and crying and hollering. And you know, my thing is to be that calm presence, that safe presence where they feel as if, okay, they can get out, you know, every emotion or whatever they need to. And so with adults, I even try to go back to that and draw some elements out of my trap chaplain training and integrate it into my clinical practice because I trained at a level one trauma right here at Memorial Hermann. And you know, when you deal with that type of population, I I dealt with, you know, now there it was mostly adults. They had a children's hospital where I did do some chaplain coverage when we had to be there on the weekends. So in reference to adults, that's more or less where a lot of my clinical training and, and interaction took place, but it was very valuable and very helpful. And you hit on a lot of strong points too, especially uh, really strongly when it comes to guys, because like you were saying, like boys don't find things like that uh, and when they get older, like all that like past trauma, eventually it, if they haven't expressed their love in some kind of way, it basically just bursts out and that's why it has a lot of guys, I mean, you're seeing more common instance where like guys mm -hmm. have held stuff for so long and it finally comes out and hopefully it's not in a harmful kind of way, but it's just a stronger message to tell to others. Uh, it is okay to express yourself or how you feel or just connect to someone so you can reach out and get that kind of help or let things out because, you know, us guys to talk to guys or, you know, just let yeah. out or the same thing with women. They like to like uh, talk to different people so they can have an understanding because every day we are learning and our journey and much more to reach certain um, goals or get over a couple of hump and things like that. So we always got to keep moving forward. So you're definitely spot on for that. Uh, okay, next thing I want to hit on is like, tell us a little bit about your book. Uh, I'm pretty sure they want to know about the title and like some of the information that's in there as well. I see the smile on your face. So go ahead and put this up sign about the book that you put out. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm so excited. Uh, Empower, and again, there's six of us. There's six of us co-authors. Um, I want to give a shout out to Gay Willis, who who has 
allowed me to be a part of this beautiful project, I, I will forever be grateful to her. Uh, the way that I even became a part of this anthology is, is just, it's a testimony, it's a favor of God, it's a grace of God. And I could truly say it, it was the grace of God. And, you know, I remember I was at a networking event. It was June 25th of 2019. I wrote it down in my gratitude journal. <laughs> I, was, I was like a kid at a candy store. I was like smiling on the on the rail all the way home. I'm like, come to be a published author. And so just getting that inbox of, hey, where's your manuscript? And I was like, I'm like, huh? I'm like, what? And she was just like, where's your manuscript? And I've been working on it. Now, mind you, this was during the time I was not working. I was looking for a job and still working on the manuscript. And the book Empower is, is what it is, Empower. We, we, I use the word we, but we want to empower men and women through our stories of, of struggles and of adversity that struggle doesn't have to be, be your identity. Struggle does not have to have the last word. And I'll go back to what I said, and I say, you know, without, without apology and with conviction, my faith in Christ sustained me uh, during a period in my life when it felt like my strength was literally hanging on a thread. And I was, you know, I said to God, if you don't, help me get through this i will not get through this i i need your strength you know lord i need you now and i'm i'm so grateful for my faith in christ i can't speak for other people but i know uh what he's done for me and who he's been and so in the book i talk about going through a infidelity in my marriage while i was working on my associate's degree um i talk about you know coming home and discovering you know, what I discovered. And, and one of the things I said in my book, I said, you know, for me, I had a trauma reminder and I couldn't run away from it. I couldn't just be like, you know what, we're going to move and get another apartment. <laughs> it didn't work that way. So I had to come home every single day and face, you know, being reminded of, of being you know, betrayed and having to wrestle with that and, and even wrestle with God, wrestle with my faith. And as I look back on it, though, again, it's helped me to become the per the woman of faith that I am now. Those tough times, you know, helped to develop that resiliency that hit down the road helped me to deal with the bigger challenges that were to come that I, you know, I could not have foreseen back then. But I talk about that. And then I talk about our marriage gets on track, you know, and then he dies. <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, then when he died, having no job, coming to my grandmother's house with the clothes on my back, having to give up my apartment. I couldn't even get into my apartment for two weeks. So my whole life, my whole life has been thrown into a tailspin in less than a day. And I was just like, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to rebuild from this? And in my book, I say, you know what I said? I didn't have anything in, the, in this natural realm. I didn't have anything in this material realm. But I had God. I had God. Because I had him. I had, had everything I need. And I still have everything I need because I have him. I had a conversation uh, with, the, with one of my clients the other day about the meaning of rich what do you mean by rich is rich just having stuff because i could argue you have a lot of people who have a lot of stuff and they are so miserable i mean miserable but they got all the money all the houses all the yachts and by appearance say they should be the happiest people on the earth but they're just like it seems like the more they get the more depressed they get and so for me actually having some things stripped away from me during that time i'm not looking back actually taught me how to hold on to god with my everything and it taught me that you know when the trials of life hit when everything else is stripped away that's the one thing nobody can take from me they can't take my faith in christ they can take my stuff but oh, we're that's speaking the one on thing. this 
definitely a strong message because it brings um, the, to a strong point of you not only have the physical fight, but you also have a spiritual warfare as well. So a lot of times we see, you know, physical things that people go through, but it's also internal and the spiritual. And you hit a lot of really great points when it came to that, because a lot of times, you know, as you say, you see all these different people, you know, have riches in the world and things like that. And people assume they should be happy, you know, see successful and all that much more. But if this is right here in the core, it's not set, you can pretty much be tore up from the inside out. And that's what yeah. you're saying, just completely miserable. So definitely that's a big thing that I think needs a bit more awareness that we not only have a physical fight, but also a spiritual fight mm-hmm. as well. So all great points transition to the thing, next thing before we wrap things up is what do you have going on in story and events, things like that, so we can have the audience looking forward to it? Well, I don't have any particular uh, events quite lined up yet, but what I do encourage people to do, if they can, is go to my website, thecomcorner.org, and I have a blog section where I have all my blogs thus far. They can, you know, feel free to comment on my blogs. You know, I believe that we learn better when we learn in community and we can learn from each other. There's not a human being on earth that I can't learn from. And the day that I start having the mentality that I know everything, I'm in a dangerous place because I don't, I will never know everything as long as I'm breathing. So I'm always going to be in a place where the next person can teach me something because you know as i'm just walking with god into in this new season i'm learning that he's sending people in my path that may have some resources or some wisdom like i don't have but that i need and uh, vice versa so with that being said i segue back to my website and the blogs that's why i encourage people to comment to to read to even integrate and share their experience of Okay, I did this challenge, you know, this week that Erica talked about it. And it's, hey, I learned something new, you know. I kept the gratitude journal for a week. And I found out that gratitude gratitude journal, you know, gratitude will bring you a long way. It'll get you further than complaining will. And so, I'm, again, excited about the book. But I also want to let people know how they can uh, obtain my book. If they go to to bornsandnoble.com or amazon.com and because there are six of us you know you choose an author and they would choose erica denise fulton and so those those are the ways of just obtaining my book and my heart and my prayer is that men and women are encouraged through my story to take their pain and turn it into purpose the best way that you can grow from a trial is take that pain and turn it into purpose don't waste it because i do believe we have an enemy and i believe we have an enemy and so i say to myself the best revenge i can get on him is to share my pain and take it and turn it into purpose so that's that's what i want to leave people with take that pain and turn it into purpose. Cause somebody needs to hear your story. That might be a single mother with three kids that needs to hear how you made it over. And that right there is like a strong point right there because every person has their own story that they need to live out to because you never know who's watching, who needs to hear it so they can overcome their adversity and challenges. So you are spot on to that. So this is a strong message to the audience. Make sure you document and live your life and push it because you may be encouraging someone else to overcome their challenges and they really need it. There's always a need for a new leader. There's always a need for a new mentor. There's always a need for teachers and much more. We're always students in the journey of life because it's not a sprint. It is a marathon and it's a long journey, but you must always, always continue to learn. So with that, we're going to go ahead and close everything up. It's your host, Chris Holmes, okay. bringing you great guests to inspire you. We're going to make sure that we provide all the links that she has stated in the uh, description below so that you can get all that great information and stay in contact. And then I'm going to have to add you if uh, you have Facebook to one of my private groups so you can start sharing those blogs and getting that out there so you connect to other different people and share your story because it's all about connecting with people. 
So I'm your host, Chris Holmes, and I have my guest by the name of Erica Denise Fulton. Awesome. So we're going to go ahead and close this out and make sure that you uh, share, subscribe, and keep the message going because everybody has a story to be told and we got to help keep keep people going to the next level because they deserve greatness and don't give up on your dreams because your destiny awaits. So peace and much love. I put the way. I put the way.